Okay, welcome back y'all, welcome back. Let's move on to the next lesson now. We're gonna start wrapping up the topic of descriptive statistics. As a reminder, descriptive statistics are numbers that are used to describe a set of data. So, in a previous lesson, we introduced the different measurements of scale, we introduced the uh, differences among independent and dependent variable, we talked about the experimental method, and then I began to transition to descriptive statistics, which was the frequency distributions. You now saw how simple frequency distribution looks like. You saw the cumulative frequency, relative frequency, and then the most important of all those is the percentile. Now, as we transition now, those ones are also descriptive statistics. Those are called measures of central tendency. All right? What they do is also try to organize the data. If you remember, the thing about the simple distribution, the frequency distribution is simply trying to put up the numbers in order. When you have a set of numbers that are too messy and all over the place, you want to line them up in order and say this is the most common one, this is the next second common one. Say something like, okay, you put them in order, 90%, the percentile, 90% are at this point, and everything after that is below. Those are good skills for you to start to read the numbers in a more uh, organized manner. So when you come to the measure of central tendency, they also try to organize the numbers. The thing here is they try to organize the numbers and break it down just to one number. The one number that you would have then would be trying to kind of paint a summary for everything that was collected in the data. The most common methods or the most common forms of central tendency are the mean, median, and mode. So let's talk a little bit about that and enjoy it because it's going to be a super simple lesson. So let's say that we, again, playing with numbers, say we have a test and we have five grades. We have a 7, 8, 8, 9, and 10. What you do is then you're going to add up all the numbers and what you do here is this, you want to remember this Greek E is called sigma. You're going to see now sigma, you're going to see here now something going up saying sum of, which means that this, when you see that it means that you're going to add up all the numbers. So 42, when you add all that, and the end, remember, is for sample size. In this case, we have five scores, so a sample size of five. Super simple stuff. The mean is the average. To find the average, you've got to get at all the scores divided by the amount of people that you have. So in this case, two equals to five. I'm sorry, 42 over five is going to equal to 8.2. So this is just telling us Based on all the numbers that we have, if we add them up and we divide it by the number of people that we have, then it's going to give us an 82, I'm oh, sorry, an 8.2. The median is the number that you get right in the middle. So, in this case, we have five scores. The median is the number that is right in the middle. So, position index 1, 2, and right in the middle, you have a 3. It's okay if we repeat, that's fine. But the thing is, you get a number in the middle, 3, and then 4 and 5 don't count, so the median is the 8. Couple things that you want to know here though. At this point, you have um, odd numbers because you only have five scores, so it's easy to find the one in the middle. What happens if you have even numbers? So instead of having five, what happens if you have six? So let's say something like instead of nine and ten, you have also another ten here. What you would do in this point to find the median is you're going to add the two numbers in the middle. So it's going to be eight plus nine is going to give us a seventeen. 17 then divided by 2 because there's two numbers in the middle and that's going to give us uh, 8.5 so then the answer for the median would be an 8.5 cool lastly the mode mode is the most often the most occurring the, the most common number so the mode at this point would be the 8 because it's the only one that is repeated boom that's it mean median and mode the thing that you want to know here, however, is the most common one reported is the mean. That's the most common one. However, means are good when you have ratio or interval scales. It doesn't make sense to use a mean when you have nominal data or ordinal data. Think about it. You have nominal data because you're trying to separate males and females. How are you going to get an average about that? So the average is 1.5 males. Makes no sense. 
When it's nominal data, you don't do that. When it's ordinal data, you don't do that. So say there are 10 places in the races, and it's first place, second place, third place, fourth place, and so on. How are you going to find the mean in that? Are you going to say, okay, the mean in those 10 places is going to be a 5.5? It doesn't make sense. So you use this only with interval and ratio data, which is what most often we'll use in the semester. Um, the median and the mode can be good for nominal data or ordinal the mean. Yeah, I'm sorry, ordinal too. So I'm taking Spanish. Um, it works. It works. One thing that you want to know is sometimes, however, say that okay, we have all these numbers here, but we also have a one. When you have one number that is far, far, far away, that number has a name. This, make a mental note, is called an outlier. It's, just out, it's laying like all the way out, an outlier. It can be an outlier all the way to the bottom or it can be an outlier all the way to the top. When that happens, that's going to distort the data and it's going to make the numbers look very, very different. When you have some outliers, the mean, even if you have interval or ratio data, when you have a couple outliers that pull the mean all the way down or all the way up, then at that point it may be better to use a median or a mode. I put up an example in the slides in regards to money, because when you take the average means, because you have some people that are making way too much money in the country and in some cities, compared to the rest of the people, it makes seem to me like everybody's making a lot of money, but it's actually some people that are making billions and billions of dollars compared to everyone else that is in the low thousands, and it makes pulling like all the mean up when you have those outliers. Quick story, uh, when I went to my first year at UTEP, there was a very famous uh, football player who was a quarterback for the team. Jordan Palmer who was the brother of Carson Palmer who ended up being a big star in the NFL. And I remember there was a statistic showing up of graduates. I was a freshman and they were seniors. Um, graduates in, uh, in El Paso are making really good money and they're showing up the statistic and it shows like all the graduates in this specific generation are making a lot of money. What happened is, it is so obvious that it was even funny, Jordan Palmer was taken by the NFL and he was making millions and millions of dollars so just by his but by his name and his salary he was pulling everyone up you took off your Palmer everything else fell down outliers make the data super tricky so you gotta be careful about that those are the measures of central tendency now let's transition into the measures of variability that's gonna be the second lesson and in the seconds in the, in the measures of variability then I complement what you see here alright okay now the thing here is with the measures of variability, what are they trying to give us? The measures of central tendency summarize all the data into one number. What the measures of variability try to give you is they try to complement the central tendency by telling you how much scores vary. You only have one number, but it may be sort of tricky if you don't know how much the numbers were varying within. So, typically the bigger the variability, the less reliable the central tendency may be. The lower the variability, the more reliable the measure of central tendency would be. And I'll talk about that later on and we'll see it more and more as the semester goes, as the course goes by. So, let's put it like this. We have again a list of grades. I, I, I changed them up a little bit from the first example because I wanted to have uh, addition, making it a 45. So we could make it a little bit easier. So if you add up all those numbers, we have a 45, right? Now, if you divide it, again, say, by 5, the mean, and this is something that I forgot to tell you in the first half, the mean could be this, which is mu. Mu is the population mean. This is something that is used when you're taking out the mean from a population. When you're not taking the mean from the population, you use either x hat or capital M. Both signify the mean, which is the population from the sample. So 45 was the total here. 
divided by 5. At this point there, we changed a little bit, a little bit, because we have now a mean of 9. Alright? So, the range. The range is super simple. The range is just taking the highest number and subtracting the lowest number. So, I put it here. The highest number is a 10. The lowest number is an 8. Here's the range. Typically, the bigger the range, the more variability there exists. This, however, doesn't tell us what's going on in the middle, what's happening in the middle, so do we want to fix for that. We want to know what happened in the middle. Uh, by the way, I'm realizing here that I put up the numbers backwards, I should have put the 10 at the top, but it's okay. Just forgive my mistake for this, but when you're doing a frequency distribution, remember to always begin with the highest number on top. Now, okay, so we get a mean of 9. We're going to take a variance. What we need to do is find... The SS. SS stands for sum of squares. The sum of squares. It's trying to tell us a little bit of what is the differential on the scores by trying to take what is the differential on each square value and then adding that up. So what we're going to do is super simple. We're going to take the 9, which is the mean in this example, and we're going to subtract it from each one. So 8 minus 9, minus 9, minus 9, minus 9, minus 9. Cool. Then we get the results. Minus one, minus one, zero, one, one. Hopefully you have your notebook in front of you because you want to make a note here. When you subtract the differences like that, all the numbers here, if you add them up, it should always equal to zero. If they equal to zero, then you know that you're doing things right up to this point because we're doing it by hand. By the end of the course, I'll show you how to do it by computer. But for now, let's do it by hand so you know what's behind the numbers. This is not the sum of squares yet, though. So we're going to square each number. So in this case, we're going to be 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. We're going to add them up. 4. Okay? The sum of squares for this example is 4. Their deviation, their changing, the variability that exists uh, far from the mean is a 4. So this is going to give us the variance. So what we're going to do here, we're going to plug in the variance. And we're going to divide it by the, the mean. So once we do that, the variance is a 0.8. The variance, however, is considered too broad. So you need a number that is going to narrow it down even a little bit more up to the point that it's considered a little bit less biased and a little bit more conservative and especially a little bit more accurate. This is when you get it to the standard deviation. The variance, by the way, could be the symbol of an O with a hat, this, this is the symbol if you're taking the variance out of the population. If you're taking the variance out of a sample, then you use S squared as a symbol. Alright? The standard deviation could be a symbol of either S, just one S, or SD. Cool. The standard deviation is super simple. It's just a matter of taking the square root of the variance, in this case specifically, point eighty nine. We're, we're trying to summarize this and bring it down to two decimals, at least in this class. Although some professors will say you should bring it to three decimals and so on. For class purposes here, two or three decimals is fine, but I'm fine if you leave it at two decimals, so 0.89. What is this trying to tell me? So we have our standard measure of central tendency, which is going to be my, my mean of 9. So out of our range of scores that we had, we had a 9. Okay? This is the average of the scores from this exam. And how much the scores vary 
0.89, which is very low, is telling me that this number is truly reflecting on what happened in, in the population rates. You can play with the numbers and try it on your own. Change one of the 8s on your own for a 2. Instead of an 8, there was a student that got a 2. An outlier. Notice how big, like it balloons up, what is going to be the standard deviation? When it balloons up, then you know that, ah, uh, I, I, I don't think I can trust this number. Typically, the smaller the variability, the more and more the central tendency accurately reflects what it's trying to say. So they have to be together. Typically, the most common measures that are reported and the one that we'll do most in this class is going to be the mean and the standard deviation. The mean and the standard deviation. To summarize it, I love sandwiches of peanut butter and jelly. So I always kind of think about it, you know, they're meant to go together. It's like peanut butter and jelly. It's meant to go together. If you prepare a sandwich with peanut butter and so on, ah, uh, something is missing. And if you got the jelly and so on, it's not the same. You got to complement it. That's the thing. You got to complement your mean with your standard deviation. Don't forget about it. That's going to be the measure of central tendency. It's going to be the measure of variability. I do want